Sunday nights, I'm teaching on the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. These two books were a puzzle to me when I was a young preacher. I wanted somebody to, to give me a book that would, I could read it and I'd understand it all. Well, after about 50-something years of studying, I found out you don't understand it easily. I'm going to try to give you a... I'm going to try to put up on the board a basic outline of what I've been teaching you without commenting a lot on it. I'm going to try at the front of the message. And then once I get to spreading out, then you'll realize I've kind of got through as much as I can. But I want to... The whole idea... We're talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel. We're talking about the 70 weeks... Weeks of Daniel. Of Daniel... And we're talking about the beast, the beast, and Israel's apostasy, Israel's apostasy. Now, this all began in the Garden of Eden with Adam. And Adam had a son that had the approval of God upon him, and his name was Abel. Of course, Abel was slain by Cain. And then Abel had a a brother who took his place. His name was Seth, as it was the custom of the Jews for the surviving brother to take his place. Of course, Cain was an evil man. He offered the works of his hand. Abel offered a blood sacrifice. The lineage of Seth, Seth means substitute. He was Abel's substitute. And it was that custom in the Jewish family for a surviving brother to to marry his brother's wife and raise up sons to his brother. And that would actually be Abel's lineage. Well, this is Abel's lineage is what it is. Seth, there in Genesis, the fifth chapter, Genesis 5, Seth's lineage goes all the way down. and goes through Enosh and Mahalalel and down through uh, Jared and down through uh, 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 through um, Methuselah, uh, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah. This is all one family. Is what it is. This is one man begetting one seed after the other. And then Noah has three sons: Japheth and and Ham. And Shem receives that blessing. Bless be the Lord God of Shem. And then we get the word Semitic or Shemitic from the word Shem. Semite or is Jewish. And, of course, about 280 years down the road, Shem has a great, 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 great grandson. His name is Abraham. God forms his covenant with Abraham, gives Abraham the land of Israel, and then that is passed on to Isaac, his son. It's given to Abraham in Genesis 17 and to Isaac in Genesis 17 and then that is given to Jacob in Genesis 28 28th chapter and Jacob's name is changed to Israel Israel in the 32nd chapter of Genesis and then uh, Israel or Jacob has 12 sons and his 11th son is Joseph Joseph Now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, these are the four patriarchs of Israel. Joseph receives the promise of God, and Joseph, of course, is sold into Egypt. Now, this is exactly, this is exactly the way things go all the way through Genesis. This is a timeline. If you get this, you've got an understanding of what's going on. Well, of course, uh, God brings them out of Egypt at the hand. Uh, They're sold into Egypt. They stay there. And Joseph brings his father and all his family over there. Seventy souls come over to Egypt in his family. And then uh, 400 years later, 400 years later, 400 years in captivity, then Moses is brought, is, is born as the deliverer to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And all of the book of Exodus, Exodus, Now, the law is Genesis, the law. The law is Genesis through Deuteronomy. We call that Pentateuch. Pentateuch, 
And the Jews call that Torah. It's the first five books of the Bible. Pent means five. So when you get into Moses, you get into Moses in the first chapter, well, actually the second chapter of Exodus. Exodus, so Exodus, we get the word exit from Exodus. They're going to make an exodus from Egypt. They're going to exit Egypt. Exit, out, remember? So they come out of uh, Egypt and they exit Egypt all the way through Exodus. You get all these laws of God and then you get into Leviticus. Leviticus, that's the Levitical law of the priesthood. Priesthood. And then you get into Numbers. The book of Numbers. All of the law has been given to Moses in Exodus and Leviticus. Then you get into Numbers. Numbers is a very important book. I used to think when I was a kid I wouldn't look at Numbers. I thought, well, that's just about a bunch of Numbers. I thought, that must be boring. Numbers is all of the events. Moses brings the children of Israel out of Egypt, gets the law on Mount Sinai. Then they are made to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. From the time they leave Sinai with the law, there are 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, all of these miraculous things that happen, they come up against their enemies, the cloud by day, the fire by night to lead them. And every time that cloud would start moving or that fire would start moving, that meant it's time to pack up and leave. When that fire moved, it, that fire was there at night. They usually moved during the day. But if that fire started moving or the cloud started moving, they started packing up fast. Because, and they followed the cloud. They followed the fire. Numbers is all of the events from Mount Sinai all through the desert, all their encampments, Till they come up here just east of the Dead Sea, just as they cross over, it's all of the events that happen in the wilderness. Deuteronomy, then after that, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. It comes from duo, or, or, we, or we say duo, or we say duet. A duet is when two people are singing together. A duo is two in the word nomos. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. Nomos. That's the Greek word law. So this means second law. This is God reinforcing what he has said back here in Exodus and Leviticus. That's what this is right here. God reinforces it. And Deuteronomy is the law that's written just before they cross the Jordan River to go back in and possess the land. That was given to Abraham back here. Given to Abraham. Where's Abraham? Here. The land is given to Abraham. So they come back to the land that was given to Abraham. Abraham is around 2166 B.C. And Moses is leading the children of Israel back into that land around 14. 25 B.C. So there's a lot of difference between Moses and Abraham, isn't there? Now, when they come into the land, Moses has received the law. And he's been told. Now this, if you learn this timeline, you can add all the studies of these books for yourself and fill them in. This is a basic timeline of what happens from the first of the Bible up to where they're going in to take the land. When they go in to take the land, that's the book of Judges. Well, Joshua also. Joshua is where there's a division of the land and where they're going in to conquer the cities. And Joshua is where they set up the division of the property or the land. And every tribe had certain properties. We know that Judah and Benjamin was down here in southern Judah. And that northern is was up here when you had, and then you had half the tribe of Dan over here on the east side of the Jordan River. And you had half the tribe of, not Dan, Manasseh, half the tribe of Manasseh over here and half the tribe of Manasseh on the western side of the Jordan River. Now, we're talking about the 70 weeks. Well, God tells Israel, I'm going to be your God, tells Abraham, 
And the land here in Deuteronomy 28, the land will bring forth all kinds of crops and you'll be able to whip your enemy and I'll be your God and you'll be my people and you'll be fruitful and multiply and your wombs will be full and your basket will be full and your store will be full. But if you go after another God, when I give you the land back, well, they were under judges for about 300 years, a few more or less, and they were under kings, under kings. This is Israel. All the Bible is about Israel. That's all it's about. And it's about all the people that oppose them. There's no other reason in the Bible. The Bible doesn't have anything to do it has nothing good to do with people that are vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. They're just there to be fitted for destruction. God picks them up to whip his people with. That's all. Now, they become a nation. And from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, this is the time they were a nation. And all the time they were a nation... God tells Moses, when they come out of Egypt here, when they come out of Egypt under the hand of Moses, when they come out of Egypt, he says, if you're dis you tell the children of Israel, if they're disobedient to me, I'll send the sword against them. I'll send their enemies to, to come into their cities and just crush them. And I'll send the famine. And I'll send the pestilence, all kinds of disease... And I'll send all kinds of plagues and I'll kill them by the hundreds of thousands. Even millions later on. Well, we know that Israel went after Baal and the grove. And they had many generic names. Baal was Hercules. The grove was Venus. Baal had all these other generic names depending on what city was or what other nations were around it. And God said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to scatter you. He said, the fourth judgment, I'll send sword, famine, pestilence over and over. Well, for 500 years under kings, from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, and of course we know the nation split. The nation split under Solomon because of Solomon's apostasy. Solomon went, allowed his wives to go after Shemosh and Molech and Ashtar and Ashtaroth and Baal and the grove and all these tree and sun deities. And I want to remind you, that is the system that was brought into the church and renamed Christ Mass, Christmas. I mean, this is so astounding. You go in and teach people history, and they say, oh, yeah, just a cook, because you teach history, yeah. You know, George Washington was the father of our country. Get rid of that guy, <laughs> you know. All right, now. Now, God split the kingdom. Here's the two kingdoms right here. They're southern Judah, legitimate kings, northern Israel. These aren't. All the kings out of Judah cut, go back to David, right here. Other than Athaliah, and we don't even talk about her. She's a witch. Now, talk about her later. Now, when it split, northern Israel corrupted itself first. And northern Israel was carried away in 722 B.C. And, of course, northern Israel corrupted itself with... Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel, and they made Baal in the grove, the, the god and goddess of Israel. And then God carried them away by the Assyrians, and then Babylon carried away southern Judah in 586 B.C. Now this is where we are with the 70 weeks of Daniel. The 70 weeks of Daniel, actually all of the picture starts here when Israel goes after all these gods and God scatters them. Now let me erase all this and let me go back to the 70 weeks. Back to the 70 weeks. Well, in the laws of God, in his Levitical laws for the Jews, that the priests were supposed to be preaching to the Jews, and you'll find it in Exodus, and you'll find it throughout Old Testament... The Jews had seven, they had a sabbatical year. They had a sabbatical year every seven years. Every seven years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That means the land had to rest. We have crop rotation. If a farmer 
has several tracts of land. He can't plant them all every year. He has to rotate crops. Plant these one year and leave these alone. And then the next year plant these and leave these alone. And, I, and I'm not a farmer. I don't know exactly how they arrange that. They get these farm agents to come out, environmentalists to come and check the ground and find out what they need to apply to the soil and what they can plant over here and what crops they can plant here that, that draw out certain nutrients out of the ground. You can't plant crops every year. I got to thinking this afternoon. We can burn up ground real fast by planting a, a garden every year in the same spot. How rich... Do you think the land of Israel had to be to last 500 years? It was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was the richest of land. But the Jews finally burned it out in 500 years of never keeping sabbatical years. And it was because of their greed. I won't go through sabbatical years again. I'll just go ahead and say this. They had a 500-year period from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. Now, the reason we're teaching the 70 weeks of Daniel is because it is the very bridge to all prophecy of the Old Testament and the New. I believe, some people don't believe this, and I'll show you why I believe it. And I'll show you why they, why they don't believe it. And I'll show you why what I believe holds more water than what they believe. Now, for 490 years, Israel never kept their sabbatical years. 490 is 7 times 70, or 70 times 7. That is the 70 weeks of Daniel. They had all of these years. Now, if they're not going to keep... Those laws, because of their greed, they didn't keep any of the other laws of God. They went after other gods, Baal in the grove and Shemash and Molech and Asheroth and the tree goddesses and Hercules and Venus and all the rest of these. Went after Allah, the tree god. So here's, let me erase this and make this fairly simple. They had 490 years. They never kept their sabbatical years and their sabbatical years has everything to do. Sabbatical years has everything to do with, with the covenant God made with them. You have to abide by the sabbatical years in order for the land to bring forth its crops, don't you? You got to do some kind of crop rotation. You can't plant ground every year, anywhere in the world, anytime in history, every day. Every planting time, you can't do that. God has an ecological balance, and that balance calls for some kind of, some time for the land to lie fallow. And what happens during that time, the grass grows up, it, some of the old crops will grow up, it'll rot into the ground, and all of that during the periods of sabbatical years the, the rotting, decaying will fertilize the ground and the minerals will go back into the ground and they can grow the next year. That's why we rotate crops. We figured that out. Now, they had 490 of these years. When Daniel 9, 24, Daniel is in Babylon. He's been carried away in this captivity where Nebuchadnezzar has come and carried him away and, gave, and Daniel is crying unto the Lord, Lord, how long are your people and your city going to lie desolate? How long is Jerusalem going to lie desolate? And how long are we going to be in captivity? Well, Dan Gabriel comes to Daniel and says to him about the time of the evening oblation, 70 weeks or 70 Shabuah. 77s are... are, are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish all this transgression of Jerusalem, to finish the transgression of going after Baal, not keeping God's laws, to make an end of the sins of, of Israel, to make reconciliation for all the iniquity that Israel has been involved in, 
and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Now, I've already gone through those things. When all of these six things are done, I believe we'll be at the end of time. End of time. The 70 weeks of Daniel are actually the 70 sabbatical years. For every one of those year weeks, you've got a sabbatical year. And they had 70 sets of these sabbatical years. So, Gabriel is saying, because of all these sabbatical years, and Israel ignoring God, God's got a time measurement for them to repent in. Now, this is the way he's measured it out. He said, you had 490 years while you were a nation from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles that you never kept Sabbath. He said, first of all, what God's going to do, he's going to put you over in Babylon for 70 straight years, one right after the other. And that will let the land lie fallow. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in and destroy all of Jerusalem. He's going to destroy the cities. He's going to wipe everything clean. And, and Israel is not going to be nothing but a ghost town for 70 years. It's going to be in a state of annihilation to where no one wants to go in there and live or dwell. Maybe just a few nomadic tribesmen would go in. He says, I'm going to take all of these one at a time from 586 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar comes in to carry southern Judah away to 516 B.C. when the temple is finished. Now, two things have to happen. First of all, there has to be a temple rebuilt. No need for Israel going back and possessing their land. This is the saddest time in Israel's history. Because for 70 straight years, they had no worship of Jehovah God. And remember, seven is the number of divine refinement, isn't it? So, originally they had 490 years. And Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 29, 2 Chronicles 36, 36, and Zechariah, the first chapter, first chapter, the Bible says that Israel will be carried into captivity until the land has enjoyed their Sabbaths to fulfill three score and ten years. A score is 20. Three score is three times 20 is 60, plus 10 is 70 years. And these chapters right here, Daniel says, or Jeremiah says, Israel will be over here for 70 years. And he says, if you don't go back and repossess the land, rebuild the temple as these decrees are given, then what God's going to do, he's going to measure out these original 490 years and God's going to turn you over to the beast world system. And that's the fourth judgment when God causes Israel to be carried away captive, northern Israel in 586 B.C., southern Judah, in uh, northern Israel, 722 B.C., southern Judah in 586. He says, you had 490 years? Look at this. Put it like this. 490 years. 70 times 7. 70 years in Babylon. If you don't repent, which they didn't, and God fixed their hearts so they couldn't, then he says, I'll measure out those original 490 years or 70 Sabbaths that you had. You never kept Sabbath. And he says, I'll make you repent during that time. And that'll be 70 times 7 or 490 years. And that will take us to the end of time. End of time. In fact, I put it up here simple in this box right here. 490 years. I want to give you 70 years to come back and repent. If you don't come back, I'm going to measure out the original 490 years again. And that is the 70 weeks of Daniel. That right there. But he's got a way of measuring out the 70 weeks. Now, he says, let me erase this. Sometimes I try to be simple, but I have a hard time being simple. All right, now. Now, they ha there has to be a temple rebuilt. Now, some people try to say that the temple, put this over here. They say that the decrees to rebuild the temple 
was the beginning of the 70 weeks. Let's go back over here to Daniel 9. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city, right? To bring great devastation upon them. If God's going to make an end of sins and finish transgression and do all these things, he's going to, the only way he can make that end with Israel is by spiking them and whipping them with the beast. That's Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And he's going to whip them all the way to the end of time. But Israel, when Israel is repentant, that'll be us, spiritual Israel, won't it? God's Israel. And if anyone in literal Israel is a believer, they'll have to come and join us. So he says, here's the original 490 years. They were a nation. Nation. 490 years. Or 70 sabbatical years. There's the Sabbath years. And then he says, 70 years in Babylon. And if you're unrepentant, here's the way I'm going to measure out the 70 weeks. While they're in Babylon, there are three decrees. Three decrees while they're in Babylon during that 70-year period. From 586... B.C. to 516. That's 70 years, right? All right. He says, Here I was, uh, here's how I'm going to measure out the 70 weeks. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. You're going to see when we go through these decrees, the three decrees for the temple. I don't know why somebody will say that Cyrus' decree or Darius' decree or Artaxerxes' First decree, I can't understand when they're all concerning the temple, these first three decrees, Cyrus, Cyrus, Darius, and these are all Persian kings. These are Persian kings and Artaxerxes. I always wanted a dog name him Artaxerxes. X-E-R-X-E-S. A great big great Dane and call him Artaxerxes. You know, I just thought that'd be a good name. Artaxerxes. You know. Or a bulldog. All right. Now, here's how he's going to measure. He's going, he's going to measure out, but you've got three decrees concerning the temple. They have to have a temple reestablished before they can have the 70 weeks. The 70 weeks does not start during this 70-year period because the last decree is given in 520 concerning the temple. Well, not 520. Given in 457 by Artaxerxes, and this is in the book of Ezra. All these happen in the book of Ezra. And then in Nehemiah... Nehemiah, the second chapter, this is the only place where that you have a decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And doesn't the Bible say, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, not the temple, but to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. From this decree, all the way to Jesus who is Messiah the Prince. He's the Prince when he comes into Jerusalem on the young colt of an ass, four days before they crucify him as the Passover lamb. He's presented as the king. They reject him and they kill him as the Passover lamb. Here's the way I believe it's measured out. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Christ will be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Well, a score is 20. Three score is 60 weeks. 60 plus 2 is 62, plus 7 is 69 weeks of years, right? That is 400, you multiply 69 times 7, that's 483 years. You got seven years to go. Now, here is exactly what I believe is going to be, unless somebody can show me something. They ain't never seen. 
when Jesus come in Jerusalem, he looks out over Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, as thou had known even thou in this thy day, the things that belong to thy peace, but now your eyes are blinded, they're hidden from your eyes. So the 69th week ends here when Jesus comes in Jerusalem. Then we have the birth in Acts, second chapter. We have Pentecost, which comes 50 days after the Passover. Jesus comes into Jerusalem right before the Passover. The eyes of the Jews are blinded. And then you got a 50 day, or about 54 days, until Acts 2, we have the birth of the New Testament Gentile church, which is spiritual Israel. And I've talked on that, how God pours out of his spirit, which is his truth on all flesh. And back in the Old Testament, the Gentiles were forbidden from... About to fall down. Uh, Gentiles were forbidden from receiving the truth. And that I believe there will be a time period of 2,000 years here. You say, how can that be? We're past the year 2000. Peter stood at Pentecost and said, This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days the Lord will pour out of his spirit on all flesh, and the day is with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. It was approximately 35 AD, 33 to 35 AD. In 2,000 years from that, I don't know when the last days begin, but I know they were here in Acts 2. 2,000 years from that, it's going to be 2,000. Now, I'm not saying the Lord's coming in 2033 or 2035. Except those days are short and no flesh will be saved. Now, after this time period, the Gentile church, we get down closer to the end and we got an apostasy. Apostasy. And then at the end of time, we got the last week of Daniel's 70 weeks. Last week, or the 70th week, that's divided into two parts. It's divided into two parts with great persecution, such as was not from the beginning of the world, no, nor ever shall be, will take place at that end. And that will certainly refine God's people, won't it? But what we have to do before we get into studying this further... We need to go back here. We got a 2,000 year period here. That's, that's the Gentile church. And then the Gentile church gets apostate church. And I believe what will really refine the church is that last half of the tribulation. Or the tribulation period. How many of y'all heard about that since you was a kid? That is the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks. That's all it is. That's not even hard to understand, is it? It's what it is. Now, you, some people say, I don't, believe I don't believe the 70 weeks of Daniel ends at the end of time. Well, do you believe in the seven-year tribulation? Yeah, I believe in that. Well, it's the same thing. Now, the reason we're studying the 70 weeks of Daniel is I'm going to work, us, work our way up to this so we can understand the fact that I believe we're getting real close to the end of time. Real close. See, it's really hard to believe. I was riding the other day down the street. I was thinking, it's awful hard for us to believe that there was actually a living God came and walked around on the earth and he was killed and they took him out here to a cemetery and buried him in a tomb and then he stood up on his feet in three days. I was saying... I can't imagine a man standing up on his feet after being dead for three days. I can't, my human mind cannot possibly comprehend that. I I can understand why unbelievers are unbelievers. Because I can't, I just believe it because the Bible says it. I can't visualize that. You you understand what I'm saying? Get in the reality of it. Uh, One of you had somebody die and they burn them here at Forest Lawn and you go up there and you go, oh, the grave's open. Well, he got up and walked away. That is just unfathomable, isn't it? But Jesus got up and walked away. And it's so hard for me to believe. I be- you know why I believe some of these things? Not because I can reason it out, because the Bible says it. It's hard for me to comprehend that things will get so bad, and then they'll start coming in and killing Christians and telling us we can't preach these things. 
And then all of a sudden one day, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, that's hard to believe. And you know what the lightning shines from the east to the west? It doesn't say Jesus is coming out of the east. Here's, here's the earth. From east to the west is... God's going to take the top off and go, here I am. That's hard for me to comprehend, isn't you? The only reason I can believe it is because the Bible says it. I can understand why some fancy banker or lawyer or doctor said, well, I just can't believe that. I'm an educated man. Well, that ain't never happened before. We hadn't had miraculous things going on before. Yes, we have. You just hadn't been around to see them. You have been around to see some of those miraculous wars in Israel, haven't you? Yep, we have. We've seen some of that. Now, now what I want to do is go back. Let's go back. What we're going to do is we're going to pick up, we're going to come back to this fourth decree, the rebuilding of the city. But it's very important for us to understand these three decrees that were given by these Persian kings, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, to rebuild the temple because some people will say the 70 weeks of Daniel begin here. And that's craziness to me. It's crazy. Let's go back over to 2 Chronicles, 36 chapter. Well, I know that. I don't understand them either, Mary. <laughs> Mary's sitting there like she's puzzled. Why can't these guys see this? I don't know. They're thick heads, I guess the kids. All right, let me erase this. We'll come back to that Nehemiah, the second chapter, for that first decree later. But let's do this. Let me erase this down here. And let's look at these decrees. Go over to... Let's go over to uh, Second Chronicles. I mentioned this the other week, and I never did finish it. Second Chronicles, 36th chapter. This is the chapter where southern Judah is carried away into captivity. And they're carried away, and immediately, Nebuchadnezzar carries them off. And uh, verse 20, And them that had escaped from the sword carried him away to Babylon. This is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, carrying Israel into Babylon. To spend 70 years there. Where they were servants to him and his sons, until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Now they overthrow Israel in 586, in southern Judah in 586 B.C. And then in 539 B.C., the king of Persia, or the Persian Mede Empire, Persia Mede, they are a dual empire, and that is the Persian Empire is the one that's represented by the bear, in one in Daniel 7, but he's represented by the two-horned ram in Daniel 8 because it's, a, it's a two different kingdoms have come together to make one empire. And they're going to be carried away to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath. To fulfill three score and ten years. Now, God's not taking Israel to Babylon to destroy them. He's taking them to Babylon so he can let the land rest, so the nutrients can be restored to the ground, so he can keep his covenant with them. He's not carrying them away to destroy them. He's carrying them away to preserve them because they won't keep their part of the covenant. He says, I'll make you keep it. I'll get you out of the land till I cause the land to be able to grow crops again. So he tells Nebuchadnezzar, he whispers in Nebuchadnezzar's ear, Nebuchadnezzar, go over there and pick them up and carry them to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar says, okay. And he does. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, when you go from verse 21 to verse 22, 48 years passes. From 586 to 539. You jump. From Nebuchadnezzar carrying them away to the end of his empire in verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. 
Look here. In writing, once a Persian king made a decree and put it in writing, it was irrevocable as long as the Persian Empire stood. The Jews are going to have a permanent decree to rebuild the temple. It can never, ever be taken away from them. It cannot be canceled, not under Persian law. So once Cyrus gives this decree, this is a must. Let's read the next verse and then I'll show you why. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. You say, Jim, can you show me some places in the scripture where these decrees are irrevocable. Yeah, I can show you several places. Let's go to one in particular, Daniel, the sixth chapter. Go to Daniel 6. Now, Darius is the king over Persia. Cyrus, at this point in Daniel 6, Daniel 6, uh, Darius, Darius the first, Darius the first, he's called Darius Hystaspus, H-Y-S-T-A-S, P-U-S, a P-A-S. Darius Hystaspus, or Darius the first. Now, before him was Cambyses. He's a very unimportant king, kind of a pansy. His father was Cyrus. Cambyses inherited the throne from Cyrus, but Darius won the throne because he was a great general. Now, Darius is king of, of uh, the Persian Empire at this point. Daniel is beloved in the courts of Darius. Darius loves Daniel. I mean, he loves Daniel because Daniel has proved himself to be a faithful man to the Persian kings. He's interpreted uh, visions for Nebuchadnezzar in this book, who was king before Cyrus, or long before Cyrus, uh, he's interpreted messages for these men. But I want us to read here in Daniel, the sixth chapter, to see the reason we're going to read this about Daniel is to show that the decrees are unchangeable. Once they're written down, and you have to understand this, let me say this real clear. You have to understand that the decrees are unchangeable once they're written down, in order to get to Nehemiah, the second chapter. Because Artaxerxes writes a decree down in Nehemiah, the second chapter. And that's the only place you find one written down and distributed among his kingdom. Once, once the Persian king wrote a decree, it is here forever. As long as their empire stands. And no one can cancel that decree. It pleased Darius, verse 1, to set up over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom of Persia and the Mede Empire. And, and he was a Mede king. Remember that? Cyrus was a Persian king. These were not unlike, let me just say this. Let me just say this. Persia is Iran over here. That's what Persia is. Iran over to Afghanistan we think of Persia, we don't quite picture it as where Amani the Jod is. It's the same exact place. Where Mr. Amani the Jod, that was Persia. This is Babylon in Iraq. Here's Israel here, Jordan, Syria. So Persia's over here. When Persia attacks Babylon, they come over from these mountains over here, the Zagros Mountains, and they come over here and attack Babylon here on the Euphrates River. So over here, that's, that's Persia, is Iran. We're all familiar with that. That's Amani the Jod's ancestors. Now, please Daniel, please the rise to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom of Persia, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was the first. Do you think Darius didn't love Daniel? Oh, yes, sir. He loved this man. 
that the princess might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Now, Daniel's been in Babylon a long time. He's an old man here. He's, uh, Darius ascended the throne in 522 B.C. 522 in 522 B.C. And Daniel was carried away in the original captivity. So he's uh, getting on up there, isn't he? He's not a young man anymore. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes. Well, not only did God prefer him, but it would be redundant to say that God preferred him. We know that. The whole reason of putting this down is that Darius preferred him. Because an excellent spirit was in him. And Darius had heard about Daniel's reputation, what an honorable man he was, how he wouldn't compromise anything, and how his God was uh, delivering God. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom because they're jealous, because Darius loves him better than us. But they could find none occasion or fault. They could find no way to trap Daniel. He was such a godly, honorable man. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. He's another Joseph, isn't he? He's another picture of Christ, yeah. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel. They're jealous of him. Same reason the Pharisees came after Jesus to kill him. They were jealous of him, right? Except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. We got to trap him with the laws of his God. And remember, Darius loves this Daniel. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king. They go to Darius and said, thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. Long live Darius. You bunch of phonies. What a bunch of con artists. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal decree because you're special, O king. We really like you. To establish a royal statute to make a firm decree. Decrees have to be put in writing, don't they? And if Darius puts a decree in writing, it's irrevocable. He's fixing to be tricked concerning this man he loves, Daniel. Well, you know what Darius did? He fell for a bunch of smooth talk. These guys were used car salesmen. Yeah, there's. Well, that's why they went after Jesus. It was out of envy that they killed him. All right, where was I? A firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king. And the king doesn't have Daniel in mind. He shall be cast into the den of lions. There's more to this than the little children's Bible story, folks. This has to do with the unalterable decrees of the Persians and the Medes. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing. Well, when a Persian king signed the writing... It was law from then on. That it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. There's the word adah, A-D-A. It means to depart away from or remove, adah, A-D-A. It does not, it does not alter never changes. Once a Persian decree is given, that's it. And old Darius is falling for this hook, line, and sinker. And he's got a beloved one named Daniel that he loves, and he's made him president of all the presidents. Well, 
Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. It's Persian law. Never change. Whoever asked anything of any God for 30 days besides Darius, he's going to be put in the den of lions. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, Daniel knew Persian law. He went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times in a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Whoops, he's breaking Persian law. People say, aren't we supposed to keep the laws of the land all the time? Not when the law of the land transgresses the law of God. If they outlaw preaching this message, do you think I'm going to quit? Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying, making supplication before his God. And they said, we got you now. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Haven't you signed a Persian decree, Darius? That every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall he be cast into the den of lions? Daniel knew about that decree. Daniel knew it was unchangeable. And Daniel knew that God would deliver him if he, didn't, if he wanted to, and he wouldn't if he didn't want to. And Daniel said, I will not quit serving God because of what man's laws say. The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not, which is never changed. Then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, one of your favorite people, has transgressed your law. And he knew his trick then. He knew he was tricked. And he's upset. That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, he had come in captive in, five, in 586 B.C. Regardeth not thee, O king. He has no regard for you. But Darius knew Daniel's heart. He knew that Daniel was the most honest man in the kingdom. That's why he made him first president. Nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. He don't like you. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. <laughs> Not with Daniel. He was so displeased because he had fallen into the trap of these lying, low-down crooks. And set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. He didn't want Daniel to die. He loves Daniel. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. But he knew he had signed the decree and he could not withdraw it. He truly loved Daniel with all his heart. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king established may be changed. You know what you did. You get Daniel. Why don't you want to slap these guys? Just sneaky underhand, lying low life. You didn't know Daniel the lions did had such a bunch of sleaze in it, did you? Then the king commanded and brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, These words really touch me. Thy God whom thou servest continually will deliver thee. These are the words of Darius. Isn't that great? I believe Darius must have believed God. He just got tricked. He fell into a trap that all of us are easy to fall into. When somebody starts stroking you, when you're young, you believe it. Boy, somebody starts stroking me, I say, get away from me. 
Jim, you're just wonderful, the greatest thing in the world. And I just don't know what we'll ever do if you ever die here at Grace and Truth. And I've had people come up and pat me on the back. And you're just wonderful, you're wonderful. And where are they now? They're off somewhere down the road 100 miles or 1,000 miles. Don't stroke me too hard too often. Well, when somebody strokes me constantly, I just go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I feel like you're trying to pull a Darius on me. That's what we'd start calling it, a Darius, will not we? The king commanded Daniel that they brought Daniel. And he said, thy God whom thou servest continually. He said, you served him whether you were going to die or not. He'll deliver you, Daniel. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet. And it was against the law to break the king's signet. No one could move it. And with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. He's mourning over Daniel. He loves this man and these tricksters have gotten to him. Wouldn't you hate to trick a king and he finds you out? They evidently did not know his commitment to Daniel, did they? If they'd have known that, they would have, it would have frightened them. Neither were instruct, instruments of music brought before him and his sleep went from him and Darius couldn't sleep all night long thinking about Daniel. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, the king Darius cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, are you there? Servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, Oh, king, live forever. Here's a bond you can't break. That's Darius and Daniel, can you? My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den so that Daniel was taken up out of the den and no matter of hurt was found upon him because he believed his God. And the king commanded that they brought those men which had accused Daniel and they cast them into the lion's den. Watch out who you're accusing. Darius said, I'll show you. You don't trick me, one of the dearest men that I ever heard of in my lifetime. Then their children and their wives and the lions had mastery of them, ripped them to shreds, and break all their bones in pieces. Had their, them, their children, their wives, the lions had mastery of all of them kill their entire families and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den then King Darius wrote unto all the people nations and languages that dwell in the earth peace be multiplied unto you I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble in fear before the God of Daniel he's writing a decree down Everybody in the Persian Empire will tremble at the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. Hmm. I think we'll see Darius in heaven, don't you? I think we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. And steadfast forever in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Oh, I think that's Israel. That's the church and his dominion shall be even unto the end 
He delivereth and rescueth. This is God, Daniel's God. He delivers and rescues. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius. And the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And they loved Daniel. Now we can see here. That the laws, that the decrees of the Persians are unchangeable, aren't they? Can't be altered. As long as they existed, the decree was there forever. Now, remember, in the book of Esther, I don't have time to go through it, it's a whole story, but Esther's first cousin was Mordecai. And Israel was in, in Ahasuerus was the king. That is Xerxes. That is the father of Artaxerxes. When we're talking about Cyrus and then Darius and we're talking about Artaxerxes. Well, Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S, that is also Ahasuerus. Now, during his reign, Esther, she was a Jewish. You remember Vashti, or Vashti, however you want to pronounce her name, which was one of the wives of Xerxes. She wouldn't come when she was called and, uh, to, the, to the throne room of Xerxes. So he exiled her and says, bring in all the beautiful women in the land. And this Esther was the most beautiful woman in all the land. And she became wife to him. She never told him she was a Jew or an Israelite. She never told him that. Yeah. And she never told him that. And then, to make a long story short, let me make it real short. Haman was the enemy of the Jews. He, he, went, to the, he went to Xerxes and said, we've got to stop these Jews. We've got to stop them. And Esther had never told Xerxes that she was a Jew. She, I can't. Three or four of you got talking at once. Uh, Esther was a Jewish woman. Haman was in command, was one of the commanders of Xerxes. And Haman was an enemy of the Jews, and he didn't like the fact that the Jews were beginning to get strong. And Haman went to Xerxes and said, O king, you need to make a decree to kill all these Jews because they're trying to take over your land. Xerxes said, okay, I'll write a decree out and you can go slaughter them. Well, the word gets to Mordecai out in the streets, and he comes to Esther and he says, Esther... There's been a decree made that that all the Jews are going to have to die. So she goes to Xerxes. And and she has, and of course Haman is making these gallows to hang Mordecai on. And hang Jews on. And so uh, Mordecai comes to Esther and tells her there's a decree been made and it's unalterable. And all the Jews are going to have to die. So Esther goes to King Xerxes and says, I'm a Jew. You've made a decree that I have to die. He said, oh, what can we do? She said, well, you can make a decree that we can fight and defend ourselves and we outnumber Haman's big band of army and guerrillas. He said, okay, I'll do that. So he writes out a decree. (laughs) And writes a decree, and that's irreversible. So they can fight Haman now. And they got a lot more people than he's got. So that's just another illustration. And of course, when they conquer Haman and Haman is is hung on the same gallows that he fixed for Mordecai, they call that, and that's a celebration that they call Purim. Purim. That's the feast of Purim, where they're liberated from Haman. Now that just shows, I'm trying to point out, that the decrees of the Persians and the Medes Unchangeable. Now, how much time do I have, Mike? All right, maybe I can get through this second decree. Go back. Now, since I've set this up, let's go back to Ezra, the first chapter. I've set this up, and you're ready to hear this. Ezra, the first chapter. 
Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, excuse me. All right, Ezra, first chapter. Now, when you, in my Bible, in my Bible, when you turn from 2 Chronicles, you flip the page, 36, you go to Ezra. Well, in 2 Chronicles, it does in your Bible too, but yours might start on the same page. Mine, you have to flip the page from 2 Chronicles to Ezra. The last two verses of 2 Chronicles 36 shows the decree being put in writing there in, in verse 22 of 2 Chronicles, right? Unchangeable decree. And then, uh, then Cyrus says in verse 23, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kings of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. The house of the Lord is the temple. That, and so he makes the first decree. He makes the decree, and the decree, he puts it in writing, and it's unchangeable, isn't it? Well, let's read that first decree. First decree in chapter 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. Once they write it down, it's done. See, when it says put it in writing, he said those same words back there in verse 22 of chapter 36 of Second Chronicles. Put it also in writing. Put in writing means it's an official Persian decree. It never changes. Put it in writing. Say, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house, a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people, Cyrus is saying, over there in Babylon. Cyrus overthrows Babylon, keeps the capital city of the empire in Babylon. His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Boy, Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes and Nebuchadnezzar, these were good men. Now, chapter 2 gives you a list of all the people that went up. There's millions of people over in, in Babylon. Millions. But we look down in that second chapter in verse 64, less than 50,000 go back. They're not really repentant. Verse 64, the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. Besides their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,330 and seven. And there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. There was 49,697. 49,697. Out of the millions that were over there, that's all that came back with this decree. All of Israel could have come back, but they had been liberated. And they had been, they buy land and they're prosperous in Babylon. Why do they want to go back to that wasteland? They don't. Now, all right. They start, huh? No, yeah. no, I don't know that yet. All right, now, that'd be a good thing to know, wouldn't it? You'll go home and add them up. That'd take all day and all night to add those up. And now, let's read in the third chapter. They begin this building of the temple. I don't want to read all of this. Let's read a couple of verses here. And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Cyrus gives the decree over here in Babylon, and these people come back, and they're in the various cities there. And they come back. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedach. Now, Jeshua is the high priest. And his brethren, the priest, 
and Zerubbabel. There's two that's anointed in the Old Testament, wasn't there? The priest and the king. Priest and king. Now the priest here is Jeshua. And Zerubbabel is not allowed to be king, but he is in Jesus' lineage in Matthew, the first chapter, and he would have been king if the Persians had allowed them to have kings. Zerubbabel would have been the king of Israel if it had been allowed. But he is the governor representing the Persian kings in what's called the Transjordan or the other side of Jordan region. Now, he is the governor. Now, Zerubbabel also has a Persian name. When they went to Persia, they would rename these men. Daniel was renamed Belteshazzar, B-E-L-T-E-S-H-A-Z-Z-E-R. Zerubbabel was given a name. His name was Sheshbazzar, S-H-E-S-H. S-H-E-S-H-B-A-Z-Z-A-R. That was Zerubbabel's Babylonian name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Babylonian names of the three Hebrew children. Now, let's, uh, where was I? All right, we're, let's read here. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shalatiel, and his brethren, and they built the altar of God of Israel. The first thing they built was an altar so they can establish relationship with God to offer burnt offerings their own as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar upon his bases for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings their own unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. So the first thing they built in that temple was that altar right there. They built the altar. Now, I don't want to go through every verse here. Let me see here. Look down here in verse 8. In the second year of their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shalatiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all they were come out of the captivity into Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward. First thing they did was appoint the Levites and build an altar. Now people talk about they're going to build a temple in Jerusalem at the end of time, and that's, that's not going to be the sacrifice and oblation ceasing. First of all, they don't know who Levites are. They don't even know what tribe anybody belongs to. You've got to have Levites to offer sacrifice and that will be, that'll stink to God if anybody starts offering a lamb in a literal temple, won't it? Look down here in verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple, the Lord of the Lord, they set the priest in their apparel with trumpets. Down here in verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house or Solomon's temple... When the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice. And many shouted aloud for joy because their temple had been waste for years. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. Now, they had adversaries there that wanted to stop them. Chapter 4. There were people here in, that had been in here, not great settlers. We're not talking about people going there and to build great lands. But they had what they call satraps. S-A-T-R-A-P. A satrap was an official representative of the king of Persia that was set up over in Israel to collect taxes for the king of Persia and various things like this. And these became adversaries. They were just watching over lands. They would send representatives to watch over lands. Now look at chapter 4, verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they, then they came to Zerubbabel 
and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, their adversaries said, let us build with you. Can we come help you build your temple? Can we come to your church and help you build? I don't like you, Jim Brown. Can I come help you? I'll get you if I can get in there and get under your skin. I can get in your foundation. I'd like to come help you. That's what they were doing. For we seek your God as you do. We believe in predestination too. And Christmas is pagan. Wait till I get in there. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Asharhaddon, king of Assyria, which brought us up hither. It was Asharhaddon that came in and carried northern Israel away captive. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua are not stupid. And the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, You have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. Get out of here. Now, that's not very nice, is it? But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Now, the reason I'm going through the adversaries is because this has everything to do with the decrees of the Medes and Persians not changing. Because they're going to stop the building of the temple. But wait a minute, if they stop the building of the temple, isn't there a permanent decree that never alters? They're not allowed to stop this according to the Persian decree, are they? What they're trying to do, they're not allowed to do. They can lose their heads in in Babylon for this, can't they? It is a Persian king that laid the law down. What they're doing is they're flirting with death, trying to stop the building of the temple because they are satraps. Some of them are satraps. They are particularly one man named Tatanai. We get to him. You'd think a man as smart as him would know better than this, wouldn't you? Let's continue reading. Where was I? Now, the fact that they're trying to stop it, and they do stop it, They do stop it. Let me just put up here. They start building the temple. And when Nehemiah gets the decree to build the city, and it's a written decree, can that be stopped? No way. No, you have to understand that these decrees do not alter. In order to understand the 70th week, that's why we got to go through these. The beginning of the 70 weeks, actually. Now, where was I? But you have nothing to do with us. uh, But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, our kings, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. You would think, as King Cyrus has commanded us, everybody knew the decrees were unchangeable. You'd think they would stop and check their cells, wouldn't you? Well, the temple begun to be 539 B.C. Cyrus overthrows Babylon. 538, that is that first decree in, at the end of Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter, and the first few verses of Ezra, the first chapter. That's the first decree. These adversaries, they jockey back and forth and fight the rebuilding of the temple till in 536... B.C., they send a letter to the king of Persia and they get the building of the temple to stop until the king of Persia is reminded of Cyrus' decree. The second decree is merely a decree to reaffirm the first decree when the king of Persia is reminded of this. That's all the second degree is for. The second decree is not an independent decree. It's an affirmation of the first decree. And they're fighting to stop the building of the temple. And you know what this is a picture of? It's a picture of us being the temple of God and men coming in saying, we'd like to build with you. 
we're your friends. We serve your God too. But they don't walk in his laws. And they come in deviously. There's spots on the love face. They come in and try to destroy us. You better watch out who you're fooling with. You're not fooling with me. You're fooling with God. <laughs> when you fooled with Darius, you were fooling with God. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. Boy, they had a hard time. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, wrote Bishlam, Mithridath, and Tabiel, and the rest of their companions unto Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the writing of the letter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. Rehum the chancellor and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem. Well, you're going against the king of Persia. This is an alterable decree. Watch out what you're doing. When you start fooling with men of God, God has made a decree. I've had people say, you don't need to be preaching. You better tell God that. If I'm up here preaching, you better watch out. I'm not going to do nothing to you. All my old enemies are dying and dead. And God will kill you for trying to mess with his preacher. I ain't going to do nothing to you. I'm just warning you. And boy, there's been a lot of people try to destroy us and hurt us. God's warning you. Now, where was I? Then wrote Rehum, the chancellor and Shemshai, the scribe, and the rest of their companions, the Deonites, the Apharsathites, the Tarpolites, the Ophrosites, the Akavites, the Babylonians, the Sushanites, Sushankites, the Dehavites, the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and whole noble Assyrian excuse me, great and noble Ashnapper brought over and set in the cities of Samaria and the rest that are on this side of the river and at such a time. This is the copy of the letter they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king. Now Artaxerxes means the great king. Sometimes that word Artaxerxes is used as a title. In this case, it has to, case, it has to be a title because Darius is king at this point when they write this letter. It means this is a title as well as one of the kings, or actually two of the kings of Persia. This is a title, so this has to refer to Darius. Thy servants, the men, now here's the letter they wrote to try to stop the building of the temple. And if you'll notice through all of this, it's not unlike what people say about us when we're building the temple of God. Be it known unto the king... That the Jews which come up from thee to us are come unto Jerusalem building the rebellious and bad city. Well, they were rebellious and they were bad. But these people are converted that's coming back. And have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundation. Be it known now unto the king that if this city be builded and the walls set up again, then will they not pay toll tribute or custom to Persia what a bunch of liars L lying through your teeth they're saying whatever they want to say to destroy the building of the temple just like those liars over there that wanted to have Daniel killed didn't they yeah. it's not unlike my enemies gosh it sounds like I could name some guys here so then shall the in damage the revenue of the king and you won't get in your taxes and tribute from them. Now because we have maintenance from the king's palace and it was not meet for us to see the king's dishonor, therefore have we sent and certified the king that search may be made in the book of the records of thy fathers, so shalt thou find in the book of records and know that this city is a rebellious city. Now this is amazing. They're going to search in the records to find out if Jerusalem is a rebellious city. 
But they're not going to search in the records and find out if a decree has been made by Cyrus. But that's what Darius does, searches and finds out if there's been a decree made by Cyrus in the second decree. And that comes up in the sixth chapter. Darius don't put up with any monkey shines. He says, let's find out if a decree's been made, okay, guys? And hurtful unto kings and provinces that they have moved sedition with the same of old time. They don't care whether they're building the temple. They're jealous. That's all it is. It's envy, isn't it? I've had so many people come through in envy. I think I ought to be the preacher for Jim Brown. I think I ought to do this. No, you shouldn't. You ain't no business being a preacher. If you really want to preach, go out and preach. Go out and get you a few people together and start meeting somewhere. For which cause was this city destroyed? You know, there's a lot of truth in that. The city was destroyed because of their wickedness and rebellion. But these people that are coming back are people that believe God. The ones that were carried away were carried away in rebellion, weren't they? We certify the king that if this city be built again and the walls there be set up by this means, they're wasting their breath, aren't they? Wasting their breath. This decree is unchangeable, isn't it? The king himself couldn't change it. Daniel, Darius himself could not change the decree, could he? Once it's made, it's done. Thou shalt have no portion on this side of the river, O great king of Persia. Then sent the king and answered unto Rehum, the chancellor, and to Shemshai, the scribe, and to the rest of their companions that dwell in Samaria, and unto the rest beyond the river, peace and at such time, the letter which ye sent unto us hath been plainly read before me, the king says. And I commanded and searched, hath been made, and it is found that this city of old time hath made insurrection against kings. Yeah, that's right. Boy, they lived wickedly, didn't they? And went after Baal in the grove. They were, had insurrection, a rebellion against God. They rebelled against Babylon. They rebelled against everybody. Why in the world did God love Israel? Grace. And that rebellion and sedition have been made therein. Well, they're right. They're right. But those were rebels against God. These are people that are coming back to worship God. They're accused of being people they are not. Aren't they? There have been mighty kings also over Jerusalem, which have ruled over all the countries beyond the river, and toll, tribute, and custom was paid unto them. Give you now commandment to cause these men to cease. So the king sends a letter back and says, cease building the temple. But the king himself can't stop the, stop the building of the temple because the decree has been made by Cyrus. Once one Persian king makes it, can't be called back, not even by the following Persian king. Until another commandment shall be given from me. Until I look, check into this thing. Tell him to stop until I check into it. Take heed now that you fall not, that you fall, fail not to do this. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shemshai the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem and to the Jews. I had to hurry up and get up there and tell them to stop this building. And made them cease by force of power. Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius king of Persia. It stopped in 536. That's when they stopped it. Darius started reigning in 522 B.C. So it stopped until 520 B.C. Ooh, wee, boy, that's a great number, isn't it? Enter Haggai, Zechariah. They're here for one reason. Next Chapter, first verse. Then the prophets, Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, 
prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah, in Jerusalem, in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Zechariah and Haggai had one purpose in their life. Tell Israel, get up off your bottoms and get to work. That's what they preached. Look at Haggai. How much time do I have? Oh, me. Go to Haggai. About the fifth book, I believe, from the last book of the Old Testament. Haggai. And you can see Haggai saying these very words to Israel. Was it your mic name? Haggai says these words. Here it is right here. When was this? In the second year of Darius, king of Persia. Chapter 1, Haggai. In the second year of Darius, king of Persia. The second year is 520. In the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And here's what Haggai said. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, and boy, I've heard Pentecostals read this verse and they are so stupid. Charismatics. Is it time for you, O ye that dwell in your sealed houses? In Israel and God has no house. And his house lies waste. Boy, how many, has any of y'all ever heard Charismatics preach on this and just twist it all to pieces? We've got our sealed houses and God wants us to have good houses. And God, I mean, God, what is it? This is talking about Israel stopping building the temple. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little you eat. But you have not enough. God has made famine come. Get up off your tail ends and get busy building the house of God. That's Haggai's entire message and he prophesies for three months. And then Zechariah stands up and prophesies for three years. And when you read Zechariah and Haggai, that's their whole message. To make Israel get busy and get back to building the house of God. It has... They quit building it. The first decree started in 538. They stopped building in 536 because of all the opposition. For 16 years, they sat down and did nothing. Absolutely zero. And Haggai and Zechariah come along. Boy, do you think, that, you think they're important prophets? Oh, you bet your life. Without the 70 weeks of Daniel, Haggai and Zechariah wouldn't even exist. That's the only purpose they had. To make Israel get off their bottoms and quit sitting around doing nothing in the house of God. And let me say to you and to all of us, we need to quit sitting around doing nothing, feeling sorry for ourselves because our enemies kind of got us down a little bit. Get up and build the house of God. And that second decree, when they get back over to Babylon, that second decree... Darius says, let's search and see if there's a decree. And he's king now. He says, let's search and see if there's a decree to build the house of God. Let's find out. If there is, all I will do, he's saying, is make a decree to reaffirm that decree because that decree can't be changed. My decree will be to make everybody shut their mouths. We think that we can get by transgressing the decrees of God. God has made these decrees, hasn't he? Have I have any time left? A minute. And looking at Haggai and Zechariah, then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shalatiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were prophets of God helping them. Then along verse 3 comes the enemy that's going to stop it all. His name's Tatani. 
At the same time came them Tatanai, governor on this side of the river in Jordan. He was the official representative of the Persian Empire. But he can't stop the building. The decree is permanent. And Shethar Bozni and their companions and said thus unto them, Who's commanded you to build this house of God? Then said we unto them after this manner, What are the names of the men that make this building? But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews that they could not cause them to cease till the matter came to Darius. They're going to go back over there and talk to Darius about this, the king of Babylon, or the king of the Persian Empire. Say, Darius, these guys started building again, and you've decreed that they had to stop building. And you're going to find that Darius searches the Akmatha, which is the, which is the palace of the uh, Persian kings where they like to vacation, Cyrus's vacationing palace, and he finds a decree over there. And Darius says, I'm sorry. Don't matter whether you like it or not. The decree's been made, so I'm fixing to make a decree just to reaffirm the first decree. Because that can't be changed. And I'll put a double whammy on you for this. Darius really was trying to deliver the children of Israel. We'll come back next week and I'll try to pick up here with the second decree. And I'll try to show you why the 70 weeks of Daniel could not have started with the first, second, or third decree. We'll go through the second, and maybe I can get to the second and the third decree next week. There's, there, you know their opposition to building the temple of God is the same thing as our opposition to building this temple. They claim to be our friends, claim to be, serve the God that we serve, and they don't. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for your truth. Help us to continue this message and lead us to your elect. Open up the doors out there across the country and on TV where people can hear this truth. God, will we're here to bow to your will. Lord, I'm here to do whatever you want me to do. You know you've brought me to this point, Lord. I have, brought, I have not brought myself anywhere. God, if you brought me here, I don't have that much time upon this earth. And I pray that you'll give me every opportunity possible to preach these words to your elect out here across the country, across the world. Lord, send us whatever needs we have to be able to accommodate this situation, to propagate your word of truth. And we'll continue to praise you for everything that you do in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. that Daniel story. Okay, you want me to? Okay. That's my favorite, you know that. I know it. I like that Daniel, especially when Darius felt about it all. He was something else. Ooh. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I like that too. I like uh, Daniel's, I like the Darius's uh, love for Daniel. That's fantastic. That's great, isn't it? Hey, Rusty, what are you doing? What are you doing? I've been down ill for a week. Oh, gosh, me and you both. Boy, I've been.